Welcome to another episode of Lessons from the Cockpit. I am your host, Mark Hacera, and for over 60 years, my passion has been everything aviation. I was a KC-135 pilot in the United States Air Force, traveling all over the world, passing gas for a living. On the Lessons from the Cockpit show, we talked to some of the most amazing pilots, air crew members, maintainers, and aviation enthusiasts from all over the world. What we do here is we share these combat veteran stories, but more importantly, what did they learn from these extraordinary and extreme experiences in military, commercial, and even private flying operations? This exploration gives our listeners practical advice on how does the aviation world work and expands critical thinking skills both in the air and on the ground. And folks, you're going to hear some of these stories for the very first time here on the Lessons from the Cockpit podcast. The Lessons from the Cockpit show is supported by Wall Pilot custom aviation art for the walls of your home, office, or hangar. These are extremely detailed prints on vinyl that you can peel off and stick to any flat surface. I invite all of you to go take a look at the ready to print section where there's 123 ready to print modern jets, propeller driven aircraft. We even have some airplanes from World War II. And we've recently started on helicopters, Apache, Chinooks, and Sea Kings. We also do custom aviation artwork in four, six, and eight feet with your name, unit that you flew with, tail number, even the weapons load that you want put on all of these airplanes. So please go take a look at wallpilot.com because that's how we are financially supported. Once again, we are going to talk with Royce William. He called me on the phone and says, hey, I got more to talk about. Naturally, I've invited him back. So grab an adult beverage of your choice. Sit down, strap in, and let's talk with Captain Royce Williams, MIG killer, on the Lessons from the Cockpit show. Royce, how are you today? It's good to see you. I'm uh, very good. Thank you very much. And thanks for being back with us today, because I you mentioned you had a bunch of other stuff you wanted to talk about it. And, uh, well, I uh, get uh, interviewed and usually they want to talk about an hour and 35 minutes out of a 37 year career. (laughs) (laughs) And there were other things besides that hour and 35 minutes. Well, you mentioned too about commanding a ship and what, what that was like, you know, what type of ship were you commanding? Tell us what you were doing. Uh, A career in the Navy, if you're lucky, you at some point will probably get command of a ship, make you feel like a real seagoing sailor. (laughs) I was very much pleased to have screened for a a ship. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I liked it very much. Uh, I thought it was a feather in my hat. It was the amphibious flagship for the Pacific Fleet. And as such... It was home for admirals, commodores, generals, and et cetera. And the ship provided excellent space, uh, all of the services of a hotel, plus a a fantastic uh, communication. What was the name of the ship that you commanded? You said it was an amphibious ship. What was the name of it? USS El Dorado. It was very famous in World War II, especially Okinawa. Campaign. It was the flagship for that. Uh, oh, Operation uh, Iceberg. Yeah. You know what, Royce? Yeah. My wife's grandfather was one of the soldiers who came ashore in the Battle of Okinawa. Okay. Roy, My, uh, Roy Smith. Unfortunately, huh? unfortunately, he was killed in the Battle of Shuri Castle. Oh during a mortar barrage. And, oh my, yeah. and was buried there. But here's on the, Okinawa. He was buried in Okinawa, but they moved him years later to Hawaii, and he's okay. now buried in the in the Punch Bowl with all the punch other. Bowl. My uh, brother spent time. I uh, already told you that uh, when he was going to retire, the Navy sent me as his numerical relief. So I arrived to retire the next day, having uh, and he stayed on for ten years running a swimming pool business. And uh, as such, he, he loved it out there. And he, uh, his wishes were for him to be buried in the punch bowl. But uh, he died uh, two-fourths of Julys ago 
and is buried at Miramar. Oh, I, I didn't know that they had a cemetery at Miramar. Yes, yes, it, it is uh, quite the deal. It's really coming and uh, well recognized as it should be. Yes. But they ran ran out of space out on Point Loma. So. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of folks buried out there. So, yeah. Royce, tell the, our listeners what an amphibious ship does and why all of those different groups of people are on board. Well, it's really in support of going ashore for whatever purposes, uh, setting up bases, but it's primarily known for supporting of the marine amphibious operations of going into beaches and uh, the support they need of uh, gunfire and uh, service of all types of food and and continuing in the way of fuel and everyday ammunition that you need to establish a beachhead, make it American territory for a while. How many Marines do you have on board uh, the El Dorado, the amphibious ship El Dorado? Well, uniquely, I had uh, very limited. I had my own detachment, which belonged to the ship. But when a Marine general had his staff on board, he was backed up with all of his staff and support people. So probably 40 at least. Uh, mm-hmm. The ship probably had around 400. But. And when you guys would go out to sea with your full complement, there's a, you know 1,500 to 2,000 people on board, isn't there? Uh, close to that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wish I really knew, but, uh, <laughs> once upon a time. <laughs> now, Royce, I have actually been on an amphibious assault ship, Iwo Jima yeah. in the East coast. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. one of the things that I remember most about being in that amphibious assault ship, Royce, was the command center and yeah. all of the communication, the radar and the amount of information that could be fed into that ship. Talk to us a little bit about that operation. Well, that is the El Dorado. Our main battery uh, fighting aspect of the support was its communication capability. And we had several spaces set up for the operation for uh, radar readers and and, uh, radio uh, communicators to support the uh, flag officers that are on board. At one time, I had uh, an admiral and a general and a South Korean commandor and all their staffs at the same time. That was a busy ship. <laughs> it was. It was really, at the time, the only one that had the capability while they are laying mines in Vietnam in the rivers and the ports to be in direct contact with Washington. So your communication went all the way back to Washington, D.C. Yes, it's very, uh, very, very capable. Like oh, my yeah. gosh. Great ship. During that time period, you had Korean Marines on board also? Uh, as a part of the Commodore staff, but not uh, amphibious personnel. Okay. The Our fighting forces were running the show, not uh, riflemen. Royce, tell us what you do as the captain of an amphibious ship and what you're in charge of, because this is really an amazing thing when you think of a Navy ship and all of the different departments that are on board, and you're commanding all of them. Yes, uh, and, uh, so uh, I have a specialist with uh, each department. I'm not doing this on my own by any manner. I'm just the top dog for the ship. My uh, executive officer uh, was a wonderful man and later on made captain and got his own amphibious ship. He had been a Navy pilot and decided that there was no longer in his best interest or whatever. And so he got out of the flying business and went with the the regular Black Shoe Navy. And, and, And his job on board the El Dorado was pretty much like a a hotel manager. (laughs) The feeding, the care, and love of all the uh, personnel on the ship. And as the XO, of course, he's looking at all of these different groups that are functioning because he's got food, he's got, like you said, hotels, radios, 
the command and control and, and also the care and feeding of the Admiral and the South Korean Commodore at the same time, too, doesn't it? Oh, of course, well, in support of, they have their own stewards and staff. We had uh, capability with a great supply system, a wonderful supply officer to uh, be able to deliver whatever is needed for the people that were serving. Royce, tell our listeners how you were replenished at sea, because this is fascinating. Well, the service force is another specialty of the Navy, much like the amphibs. And these ships supply all those that are at sea for any length of time. You run out of whatever. It's amazing. The maybe million of parts and stuff that have to be on board and ready and serviceable to deliver as needed. The way you do that is each ship uh, drives alongside of a supply ship, an aviation fuel ship, uh, oiler for the uh, the engines that uh, run our ships, the, f- the food and clothing and all that. And in addition, of course, uh, you're taking care of mail and uh, normal needs of life. And they have, I, I'm just amazed of all of the things they have, especially on an aircraft carrier, where you have several types of airplanes and all of them with many, many parts that are disposable and need to be replenished. It's, a, it's an amazing operation how well that works. And so you have two ships next to each other, steaming yes, on the same and, heading and the same speed with yep, things passing yep. between the two of them. Right. The supply ship sets up a course of speed and the ships have been delivered fly formation on it, so to speak, mm-hmm. as, a, as an aviation term. And uh, you send things back and forth by a series of cables that are attached to high points on each ship. And then through uh, pulleys and so forth, you hook up what you're going to send and probably either on pallets, uh, wooden uh, nets, or in their own bag, pass it to the other people. If they have something to be sent back for rework or something, they probably send something back for uh, the other ship to, to handle uh, the supply people. Uh, oh, it's augmented. And in a very important way today, the supply delivery is by helicopter. So you don't have to be really in formation, but usually that part of it is going on at the same time. You're sending it over by cable and you're delivering also by helicopter. It is yeah, the yeah. most amazing thing you've ever seen. Well, not only that, that's just uh, once it's delivered. Now it has to be placed in its appropriate spot to where it can be redeemed, picked up, and given to the needy people on demand. This is not easy. You got to keep track of every nut and bolt. Well, and the really amazing thing, Royce, was we were taking on fuel, lettuce, and bombs yep. at the same time. Absolutely. One and they all have to be properly stored. You know, some of it requires refrigeration. Some of it requires elevators to uh, deliver bombs to the airplanes. It's a it's an amazing event. Not only we were hooked up by wires, Royce. The helicopters were uh, moving stuff back and forth too. The the, the CH forty sixes or forty sevens, I can't remember which. The helicopters sure. that were in the air wing were also moving stuff back and forth and laying yeah. it on the fan tail. You know, it was just amazing to watch, particularly for the, we were hooked up for six hours, Royce. We took on 1.2 million pounds of gas. And of course, when you're moving the gas around, you have to worry about the weight and the balancing of the weight inside the the ship too. So there was a lot of planning that went on before. And and the safety. Safety Mm -hmm. is always a major concern. And since that's part of what's going on, you have to be prepared to fight fires. I had been on the John F. Kennedy for a couple of days. The cod broke and they were underway replenishing. And as you mentioned, the air wing has lieutenants that come down and that's one of their training beams that they have to get crossed off. 
Well, this lieutenant didn't show up. And they called down to his squadron. They're going, well, he's, he's, he's doing something else. He's not going to be able to come up there. And they said, okay, fine. So they hung up the phone, and Harv Henderson looked at me, and he says, hop in there, Sluggo. Con the ship. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and I turned uh, around, and I looked at him, and I said, sir, with all due respect, are you out of your mind? <laughs> you didn't trust him? I said, he are you really going to let an Air Force guy, yeah. tanker guy, yeah. drive yeah. the ship yeah. while we're only 180 feet away from another ship? He says, Sluggo? Amazing. It's just like you mentioned, though, Royce. He says, Sluggo, it's just like flying formation. Keep that blue line yeah. right there, and every 20 minutes, increase the inboard screws 1% as we take on more fuel to stay at 18 knots and keep your heading at 275. Yeah. And you'll be fine. Just make Adjust one three heading. Just as necessary. Very, yeah, just as if necessary. Uh, conversion or something appears obvious. Yeah, exactly. And so I go, why not? Okay. I put the headset on and I'm standing there with the, with the face mic on. They've got the computer screen in front of me that shows all the particulars. About 10 minutes into this, the captain of the USS Seattle, the store ship, is one of Harp Henderson's friends. And he says to him, oh, hey, yeah. Iggy. That's the way it is. Uh, yeah. Normally, yeah, the, that's, that's how I got my ship is that a uh, certain number of ships are reserved for aviators so that they know the black shoe side of the story in case they get promoted to more glory land exactly yeah. so his call sign was iggy royce and iggy? he says iggy i-g-g-y oh iggy. gee iggy yeah and mm -hmm. he calls over the radio and he says hey iggy are you sitting down now that is not a question you oh, ask oh. while you're underway you're gonna the scare him you're gonna you're scare, gonna scare the, him the snot <laughs> out of him and Iggy comes back and he goes, no, why should I be? And he, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and he says in a loud voice, Air Force is conning the ship. <laughs> oh, man. And Roll all, over. <laughs> and all five heads in his ox con turn <laughs> and look up at us. Oh, okay? boy. And, and there he's, was, he's, he's flying on you, so don't deviate. <laughs> don't cause him problems. Exactly. One of the sailors in the Oxcon had a pair of binoculars. And he turns and he looks up at me and he's pointing at me because he can see me in the Oxcon. Yeah, sure. And I lean out the window 14 stories up and I wave to him. Yeah. I wave to him. And they're all pointing at me and, he, and he's like, Nothing good can come from this, okay? But I got to do it for 50 minutes. And finally, he says, he says, well, well, Sluggo, what do you do? And I says, well, I'm an Air Force tanker guy. I'm in charge of all air refueling uh, here in the Middle East right now at the Prince Sultan uh, Air Operations Center. And there's this silence. And he goes, we love tanker guys. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. There's always being observed, but they're awfully good the they catch on real fast because if you can fly a wing at, uh, you know, 700 miles an hour, you could <laughs> probably fly a wing at uh, 15 knots. Yeah. He, he gave me a, a little bit of instruction, and, and you're right. Just keep the blue yeah. line on your shoulder. And he said increase the screws 1% every 20 minutes yeah. as we take on gas. But that's yeah. basically all he told me. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a... Uh, your uh, highly motivated watch detail as they develop. Now, one of the interesting things I found about this, Royce, was the auxiliary conning towers are these big wings that kind of hang out over the ocean. I'm imagining mm -hmm. the El Dorado had the same thing, these ox cons that you would sit in your chair and watch this kind of stuff go on. Is that correct? Well, each ship is designed differently, but uh, they have to accommodate all of the aspects that the ship's designed and directed to do and uh, a lot of that means visual you have to be able to keep track react so yeah. eyes are important how often would you have to do this well dependent of course on uh on the situation yeah 
in combat quite often uh, beans and bullets <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> they've got to they've got to be brought aboard and uh, stowed and then ready to do, deliver so maybe in a heavy combat it might be every three days uh, if you're just steaming maybe going from San Diego to Yokosuka, it, it might be a week or more. Now, you said something a few minutes ago that a lot of people in our audience probably will not understand. And I'm going to have you explain this. The difference between the Black Shoe Navy and the Brown Shoe Navy. Well, aviation uh, was new to the Navy starting in the early 1900s. It, it's feel your way. And are you really going to have them serve on ships? Goodness. Well, that took some steady innovation and remodel to make it all work and fit. So they just tagged the people that were involved with aviation as brown shoe. And indeed, we were, uh, most of our uniforms were compatible with um, the design for the uh, individual who wear brown shoes with that uniform. Uh, of course, we also had black shoes for when we uh, wore our blue uniforms. And see, I didn't know that difference until mm. I asked the guy, I go, okay, why is the surface warfare of the ship's company guys wearing black shoes? And why are all the aviators wearing brown shoes? And he told me that story. Yeah. Which I thought was, and that is one of the rich traditions of the Navy, the brown shoe yeah. versus the black shoe. And, and you can tell an that, aviator right away. I think that is still true in memory only. I believe that pretty much, for the most part, they all wear black shoes. So, but the tradition, tradition lives on. Yes. As a commander of a large ship's company like that, Royce, you're kind of like the CEO of the ship. What kind yeah. of lessons learned would you give to somebody like in business or somebody running a company that's a CEO that you learned from being a captain of such a large group with such diverse roles and missions? Frankly, what you learn is you don't know it all and you have professionals that work for you and be happy to make you happy and you rely on them. You do an awfully lot of evaluating and, uh, after a while learning to trust your own senses but you learning that and leading the, your professionals that run department. So you had to put a great amount of trust in those people that you. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Had running sure. your yeah. You're, you're up there on the bridge. You're monitoring the uh, performance of the ship overall. And as such, uh, the detail is in the hands of other people that are department heads mm-hmm. and chief petty officers who are the uh, the grit. They're the people who make yeah. things really work. They're the ones that train the people that are doing all the handling. And they're observing. They're right there as uh, important as the division officer of seeing what's going on and not tolerating goofing off or making mistakes. Yeah, the, the senior NCOs, isn't that the truth? Even in the yeah. Air Force, the senior NCOs, we Yep. Commanders lean on heavily to oh, absolutely. train and equip. They, the, and yeah, they're the tech dish. Believe me, you need them. Oh, absolutely. Oh, one thing. Yes. What uh, the purpose of the ship is? Uh, since it's a floating hotel, it's mobile, and your job is to take your your clients, the the, uh, the flag officers, to where they need to go, uh, and sometimes. That puts pressure on you. It has to be a certain port or something like that by exact or in the head of time. Don't be late for conferences and uh, meetings of all kinds, including political. Wherever you go, if it's uh, time warranted and allowed, you're going to meet with a mayor or you're going to meet with an army general or whoever is running the show where you go. So uh, be mindful when he tells you the next port's going to be the Longapo or whatever. Yeah. You you get him there so he can do his job. Now, see, that's fascinating customer service, isn't it? Yeah. With your requirements. And you said something very interesting just a second ago, Royce, and that is how political a ship is. 
how important a ship like yours is in foreign policy and port visits. Discuss that for just a moment. Well, it is because the people that you are providing service to are uh, the uh, the force that uh, presidents depend on. The military has got to be prepared to deliver. That part in the amphibs is maybe getting a Marine battalion uh, a certain place if it's friendly or making a place if it's not friendly of doing the amphibious landings, which a lot of it by now is also done by helicopter and the uh, OS-22 tilt rotor mm -hmm. that can uh, make vertical landings and take off. Boy, isn't that an amazing machine on a carrier deck on a hand now? You, know? you got to know it. it. It can haul a lot and it can haul it pretty fast and far. Yes. I know of a story, Royce, in the Anbar province where some Marines came under fire out at Ramadi. The ISIS guys didn't realize that they were being supported by V-22 Ospreys that are yeah. so much faster than normal helicopters. They showed up in half the time and they were able to wipe out this ISIS group because the MV-22 can do both helicopter and airplane at the same time and yeah. got a quick reaction force there to help these guys so much quicker. Yeah, and they have a movable platform. They have their own variety of aircraft carrier for the Air Force to operate in a small way of support and so forth. They have to have a base. Our base is mobile. That's a, a big factor, uh, especially if you're going to a place we've never really uh, worked with before. You, you got to set up shop and we can. And you can do it very quickly. And, and you can get people from ship to shore and back. Royce, I remember a story from Hurricane Katrina, and I heard this from the admiral who was commanding, where they took one of the big large deck amphibious assault ships into the Gulf of Mexico right behind Katrina and set up <laughs> uh, the mobile hospital. Absolutely. You know, our, our hospital ships are amazing. And even just the ship itself, I remember when the New Jersey, I believe it was, battleship went into, I think it was the New Jersey uh, city that lost all of its power. Mm -hmm. And the ship provided uh, electrical power for the city. Yeah. And, and people don't understand that. People don't understand that a ship like that can put cables ashore and provide electricity as well as setting up this mobile hospital where you can do all the way up to neurosurgery and brain surgery inside the ship. Tip top, I tell you, these people are ready for the real doctoring. This isn't so much a pill operation as it is a scalpel. An awfully lot of development of medical professionalism and methodology for this country has been developed in war. The, the army in France and the need for specialized stuff that the hospital ashore probably running across once in a blue moon. In the military, where people getting shot up, it's daily. And you guys can handle all that right on, the, on board the ship. We had a group of uh, hospital ships off of Da Nang. And one of my friends had, had been a vigilante squadron commander on the uh, Kitty Hawk when I was the wing commander there, was the commanding officer of that ship, uh, the hospital ship. There is another instance, Royce, where the Navy came to help the tsunami victims in Southeast Asia. Oh, goodness, yes. That was a horrific uh, event. And uh, my goodness, the waves came ashore and well, it's way in, way inland did uh, real devastation. And yet an amphibious assault ship like, your, like you commanded came yep. to that. That's right. And was being used as a humanitarian platform, yeah. not a and that, war platform. And that in itself is a, a goodwill where America has a unique capability and is willing to provide it. And, and Royce, I think it was called uh, Tomodachi. Maybe I've got the wrong name. But the helicopters were flying water and food yep. off of the amphibious. Yeah, they would get resupplied by yep. 
mm-hmm. a ship coming up next to them, like you were talking about. And then they would take all that stuff on shore. They were bringing people via helicopter from shore to the amphibious ships, working on them, helping them, helping them mend, bending broken arms and, and all kinds of things. And then Absolutely. taking them back to shore. Yeah, unfortunately, most Americans don't realize that we provide that for the world. No, they really don't, do they? They see a big ship like that, Royce, and they understand that Marines go out the back, but they don't understand the, that we can take and project naval power anywhere in the world, but not for war purposes, but for humanitarian purposes at, this, at the same time. Now, you said something, uh, and you, you said something that you were the commander at Nellis of a squadron. Tell our listeners about that. <laughs> An amazing event. I don't know if it ever happened to another naval officer or not. I was serving there on exchange duty. Started off as an instructor teaching uh, weapons delivery, both air to air and air to ground, to new students that are going to F-86 squadron. The next step, they took me on the colonel staff for the uh, flying group that's doing all the training. And as such, I had a a chance to get involved in the high-level stuff. And uh, fortunately, I was probably Navy prepared to handle some things that just weren't uh, comfortable for the Air Force. And I got uh, deeply uh, rewarded for it. I also went through the fighter weapon school for specialized training in uh, air combat. Uh, well, that includes air to ground. I was given the uh, command of the training squadron, standardized, teach and standardized, new instructors coming to fill in with the training squadron. And as a Navy junior officer, it was amazing because I was a Navy lieutenant equals Air Force captain all the other commanding officers were majors and lieutenant colonels. And I, I was just blessed to step in. I didn't have it very long because I was then sent back to Navy duty down at El Central, doing pretty much the same thing, instructing in the fleet air gunnery unit, predecessor of Top Gun, with uh, the teaching of tactics and uh, weaponry. Uh, I, uh, I see on your coffee cup that you have an F-86 and it looks like it's shooting down a MiG-15. It is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, here it is. Oh, that's fantastic. So, Royce, you got to meet all of the great Air Force aces from the Korean War, didn't you? Yeah. At this school, because Boots, Blessé, and all those guys came through that school. Yes, and we're, he was a commanding officer of the 96th uh, Trading Squadron flying F-86s. Uh, eventually, the 94th Squadron uh, got F-100, and I got checked out the F-100. Uh, so you got I to fly F-86s and F-100s? Yes. So what was it like flying an F-86? Tell our listeners what it was like flying an F-86, because that is that is an iconic Air Force airplane. It is. And uh, at that time, it was the best fighter we had. and. Uh, We were moving into afterburner type aircraft uh, that would uh, succeed it. This was the performer of the air-to-air part of the war in in Korea, except for my one uh, incident. Uh, But it's the one that fought the air-to-air part of the uh, Korean War on the western on the. western half of North Korea. They, they were air supreme. And I would like to have had that airplane. It was quite superior Panther I was flying when I engaged the uh, 7 MiG. How was it superior to the Panther? It and had a it... flying tail. It could mm-hmm. uh, fly faster. It uh, could go uh, supersonic, uh, normally not. Uh, maneuverability, uh, power, climb, turn, Everything you want in a fighter, it was just uh, cut above. Yeah, and you had mentioned, too, that they went from 50 caliber guns to the 20 millimeter guns in the F-86 yes, also. Yes. But they were also fighting the uh, Russian-developed MiG-15, 
which in several regards was superior to the F-86. In, in what ways, Rose, was the, was the MiG-15 better? Well, it had a flying tail, which made it a hydraulic control. A pilot didn't have to overcome the uh, forces on the uh, flying controls. Yes. And as such, it could get up to near Mach 1. And it was important because the MiGs could fly higher. And they would sit above the MiGs and choose the time, above the 86s, and choose a time to engage. So, good heavens, say, if things were in my favor, I'm not going to start the fight. Other than that, they could just stay at 55,000 feet, observe, and go back home if they wanted to. But in doing so, we learned that the MiG, not having a flying tail, could be drawn into high Mach numbers, and then having the pressure on the pilot to where he had the manual control and... You could draw him on down thinking he's going to get a shot at you. He's coming in out of range at your tail, about to pounce you. Uh, and you just draw him into that. And then you pull a hard turn or pull up re- abruptly. And he can't handle that. And your airplane with the flying tail climbs tight inside of him. And he just slides right on by it. The bang, you're on his tail. <laughs> Another thing, the uh, the MIG did not have all the nice niceties you might think, but important in combat uh, of uh, of control of the atmosphere in the cockpit of the F eighty six. Whereas you're going through various temperatures and humidities, and you can set a temperature uh, in the eighty six, and it will maintain it. Whereas the MIG 15, the pilot had to do that manually. And if he forgets it, he comes out like that, and you're hitting high humidity and you've got a cold cockpit, suddenly you're sitting inside of an uh, ice cube. And you can't see anything. You're just all frozen over. And so the pilot then just flies safely, but he's a target. He doesn't know how to maneuver. I didn't know that about the mid 15 months. Well, little tricks of the trade. Oh, isn't that the truth? And 55,000 feet, that's way up there, Russ. I mean, that's those days, way up there. I went, I went 76,000 feet once. <laughs> 76,000 feet? In what? What were you flying? A Phantom. Oh, now that was that had a lot of power, didn't it? Yeah, it, it was a Mach 2 twin engine, a lot of power. Of course, mechanical care of the pilot, of control of uh, temperature and pressurization. On this particular time, that was my mission. So I was flying a moon suit, a pressurized yes. uh, suit. So that, I was just uh, going to ask that. So if you lost pressurization in the cockpit, the suit itself provides the pressurization, your ability to survive yeah. in those conditions. So and I did that doing? once I got there. Uh, I, have, uh, I was just uh, playing games with myself to see if I could do it. <laughs> so I was prepared. So I go a uh, Mach 2 and then pull back on it to full afterburner and climb just as high and fast as I can. And I reached that altitude and that was it. I said, okay, so I dumped pressurization and uh, the, the moon suit uh, popped and my arms are now working against pressure <laughs> in the oh, suit itself. No. Oh, no. <clears throat> and it was just for fun. Just because you hadn't been to 76,000 feet, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's basically it. So <clears throat> what base were you operating out of? Where did you take off out of when you did this? I don't know. I don't know if it was uh, uh, Norfolk, uh-huh. uh, where uh, I was. A, the squadron was assigned to the USS uh, Enterprise. Or it might have been at El Central, uh, where I was... Uh, training in weapons okay. and just took the opportunity to have fun. <laughs> See, Royce, you lived in a very different time period than the rest of us did. You could go into yeah. your ops officer and say, hey, I think I'm going to 76,000 feet today. Give me a suit. And off you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But Royce, the Phantom for a long time, held all the time to climb records until I think the MiG-25 came along 
And then, of course, the F-15 broke all the big 25 records, too. So the Phantom. And the SR-71. SR yeah, yeah, I forgot the SR-71, too. So the Phantom had time to climb records for a long time uh, before. A, they friend of mine, a friend of mine that I'd served on the Princeton and in a typhoon out of Guam, uh, story in itself, we lost eight airplanes on one mission. But anyway, he was flying probably out of a test center. He brought a phantom up to 104,000 feet and was designated uh, with astronaut wings. Larry Flint was his name. Wow. 104,000 feet in a phantom. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's up there. That's way up there. You know, I mean, that's operating above the U-2 and the SR-71s. So, Royce, Tell all of our listeners, what does the Earth look like from 76,000 feet in your phantom? On a clear day where you see the Earth, it, uh, you see absolutely the, the, the planet is round. You <laughs> see the curvature of the Earth. And in itself, it's not that distant. It's miles wide. Uh, and you get a, a pretty good look at uh, the next couple hundred miles or so. And, it's just just amazing. It's what you see with the pictures that the astronauts take uh, on a little lesser scale because they really go up there. But what a what an incredible sight that must have been. Because mm-hmm. uh, you and I have both had those flights where you forget about flying and you're just looking at your surroundings, going, "Man, stunned." Yeah, stunned. You know, and and you you honestly look at. What was it? The Apollo 8 astronauts that were reading out of Genesis when they're looking back at Earth for the first time and they're saying, yeah. you know, look at what yeah. God has created. That was, I, I, I like that aspect of that flight to recognize God did it all. <laughs> we we're just a speck. Isn't that something? And that was the first time pictures had been that I remember of pictures being taken from the moon looking back at Earth and, and them talking from Genesis and yeah. so forth. And I, I know it was Neil. I, I think that was Neil Armstrong. I think you're who right. I got to meet. Yeah. I got oh, to did meet you? Him. Another, and some of the others, a, an amazing guy, you know, yeah. nice Buzz, guy. Buzz Aldrin's the only one left alive from that crew. Mike Collins and Neil have both passed away now. Wally, Shirah, mm-hmm. all those guys. Yeah. I knew Wally fairly well. Alan Shepard was also a Navy uh, test pilot, too. Did you know Alan Shepard? The first. I didn't know him, but he started the program and he made Admiral. Yes, he did. He did. Royce, you mentioned that you went to El Centro and you start the Navy's weapons program. Talk to us a little bit. I didn't start it. I just took it a little further and I instructed in uh, tactics. And that was new to the program. Other than that, it was basically a uh, air-to-air gunnery program for the fighters and for the other aircraft, ADs, uh, F-9, F-8, basically air-to-ground rocketry, bombs, strafing, whereas I'm primarily shooting an air-to-air uh, banner target. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned but ADs. The part I brought, I was a, the ground school instructor for air to air tech. Now, Royce, during that time period that you're the tactics instructor, are you allowed to talk about what you did over North Korea with the Russian mix? Are you, are you still having to keep no, that quiet? Well, I could say what the lie was that was put out there, <laughs> in which I tended not to, uh, because I was sworn to not reveal the truth. And I didn't for 50 some years. That was not my discipline was to avoid it, but what was revealed or drift up, I could uh, talk about that, but I chose not to. It wasn't true. Yeah. But see, I imagine, Royce, a story like yours spreads very quickly. So people knew who you were and what you did, but they just didn't talk about it in real time. Well, they didn't, they didn't really know that who I was or what I did. It wasn't really anything. I didn't talk about it, and it was basically a dead deal. There was some mention of it. Actually, it just uh, died its own death. Interesting. Now, you mentioned an interesting airplane, the ABs. We call the A-1 Sky Raiders. That is a very big airplane <laughs> for a top-driven airplane, and it carried well, a lot of weapons. 
it was magic. It could do everything the B-17 could do. And it was a single engine carrier. Uh, incidentally, Sunday in San Diego was a rendezvous of World War II personnel and fighters, all, all services, uh, down in San Diego. I, I participated in it. In addition, there were veterans from all uh, wars, uh, living veterans from all yes. wars. And as I sat down at my table, I uh, introduced myself to a guy named Ray. As we talked, he said, gee, uh, somehow or other connected with a guy that lives in his care center in Chula Vista, California. And he, it was M.C. Cook. Well, he was my A.D. skipper when I was the wing commander. A wonderful guy. Oh. He made vice admiral. His last job was superintendent of the Naval Academy. So that's a school. And he came to San Diego to retire. And at that time, the, the consular, whatever he's called, the head of National University retired. And this had somewhat to do with the background that Ad, the Admiral Cook had learned at the Naval Academy. And he stepped in as the the new director of uh, National University, I think for two years or so before they got uh, another e elected or selected uh, uh, person to run it. Wow, he took that on board and ended up calling back to his home, to his home number and I talked to MC's daughter, which uh, was sort of dazzling and reconnecting. And I, it was a wonderful moment for me to be back in touch with MC. When was the last time you'd seen MC? About three years ago, I was going to a play at Lord's Well, and there he was in a wheelchair, escorted by three of his daughters. <laughs> and, oh, wow. uh, there, and we met. You know what? I probably need to have MC on the show, interview him. Oh, would that be yeah. Fun? I don't know about the frailty of mine yeah. and so forth. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, I imagine he could uh, hold his own, and he's just a great guy of the way he uh, carried out his role as the prop heavy weapon delivery guy in Vietnam was an, an, an amazing thing. Oh, I'll bet it was. Uh, he, he was just a giant of you know, much people. I, I, I like the guy very much. You know what? CJ sent me a video of you in your wheelchair. Is that CJ ah. dancing behind you? Is that CJ holding your wheelchair behind no, you? No, no, no. That's the public relations girl for uh, Otter Flight for San Diego. Ah, ah. And also working on behalf of CJ of some of her events. CJ sent me a video of that gathering and yeah, and, on the aircraft carrier? Yeah, of you guys, uh, that gathering you're talking about where you saw uh, MC Cook and everything. And it had a, the video of you in your wheelchair with her behind you kind of moving the wheelchair around and everything. It was really a lot of fun to see. No, that had nothing to do with uh, MC. Oh. We were, she was doing uh, coverage for five different stores and sponsors on the deck oh. of the Midway. And part of it was a section with me by the Panther painted to look like the airplane I was flying. That must have been amazing to hear those stories. They had all of the over 100 uh, survivors there and uh, carried a news coverage shot of, a, there were about at least six of them. The oldest 106, oh. but there were several at 101 and 102. 106 years old? Yes, yes, and fluid. <laughs> Really, he was fine. Now, he re he, he uh, referred to the other hundred-year-old uh, veterans as uh, his kids or something. <laughs> <laughs> then you're just a youngster at ninety-seven, Royce. <laughs> yeah, Royce. I want to talk a little bit more about your Vietnam experiences. Hey, I want to tell you something. Yes, it comes to mind. The first thing I did this morning was go in my jacuzzi, and in the jacuzzi room. I have numerous hats of various units that I was with. And yes. there was the Black Lion hat and the Aardvark hat. <laughs> so I saw the, saw the start of the day off fresh looking at those hats in memory of. I've got mine on now, Royce. 
BF213 Black Lions. So, Royce, I visited the Black Lions when they were in F-14s because obviously I was the guy with all the gaps. And, of course, I'm not going to visit a squatter and not get a baseball cap. So I am currently wearing my VF213 Black Lions hat. <laughs> Today, uh, luckily, I got a haircut. <laughs> I, wore, I wore my uh, hat with scrambled eggs and so forth, which says uh, World War II veteran, Korea veteran, uh, Vietnam veteran. All, all three of them are plaque uh, on the, the, the front of it with the Two sets of wings, both pilot and NFO wings. That is an incredible hat to be wearing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it gets somebody's attention now and then. When you were the air wing commander, and you mentioned you had several different airplanes in your air wing. You had two F-4 squadrons, a vigilante squadron. Did you have an E-3 Sky Warrior uh, squadron in your air wing also? No, we had uh, E-2. Oh, E2. Okay. So you didn't yes, have the it, it, it was the very first E2 deployment. And uh, a good friend of mine that relieved me uh, of my exchange duty uh, with the Air Force and then it relieved me of my instructor duty at El Central. And then he went to protect Protection River as a test pilot and he was given the mission of developing the E2 program. And so the war came along and it hadn't been deployed, but it had special capabilities. And we wanted to get it out there and test it and develop it as quickly as possible. It was said that he was the logical guy to be the officer in charge. So it was. I used so, to fly with the location. So where would the E2s set up their orbits? off the coast of North Vietnam and, and, uh, and manage like air battle manage from there. How would, how did you guys employ the E2s? It was new and we didn't know really what all it could do, but we could pass on to the ship and their CIC, the radar capability 200 miles beyond wherever the airplane is. It could be 200 miles from the ship and then pass data 200 miles from there back to the combat information center. And they could control aircraft or they could just pass the data to have it controlled by your ship. That's an incredible capability, isn't it? To be able to see that you bet, far. You bet. And now they do much more than that. They either use as tankers, they use as, as COD. Uh, yeah. it, it has great capability. So a fine, fine airplane by Grumman, of course. Yes. Yeah, Grumman Ironworks. Every air wing has like, I think, four or five E-2 Hawkeyes that are part of the air wing and do all yeah, of that. Yeah, and helicopters. Yeah. The helicopters are part of the air wing now, too, also. It's, it's changed since my day. Yeah, yeah. I was able to fly in an S-3 Viking. I think I told you that uh, previously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We went up, refueled the uh, F-18s that were on cap, and then went down and we were gathering intelligence on all the different ships that were around the carrier battle group. And everything. It was an amazing two hours, 2.2 hour flight and an S3 Viking fully aerobatic airplane. That was the crazy thing, you know? Yeah. I mean, just, and unfortunately it's time has passed. Yeah. They were going to turn them into tankers. And uh, I think the movement was well in their way, but for some reason beyond me, uh, they dropped that program. Yeah, and now the F-18 Super Hornet does the organic tanking. Isn't that crazy? With oh, five, yeah. five tanks. It, it, it's got all the missions. It really does. <clears throat> it's amazing that that airplane does all the different things. So yeah. you had two Phantom squadrons. You had a Vigilante squadron uh, as part of your air wing. What other airplanes did you have in the air wing that you commanded? A-4. A-6. Ace, oh, 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 for sure. That, the main battery, great, great airplane. For its time, that was just what we needed. Oh, that's right. The squadron was called the main battery, wasn't it? I forgot. Uh, I, I don't know about that. But my uh, commanding officer of that squadron, who was the operations officer on deployment, first CO was killed, 
Then the second CEO was killed. The uh, was the ops officer cleaned it up as he was the commanding officer. He was tremendous. He ended up as the number two senior admiral in the Navy. He was deputy CNO and think pack. And uh, what a great guy. What was his name? Ron Hayes. Ron Hayes. <clears throat> Tom, yes, Ron Hayes. Ron Hayes. Z. The Ron Hayes. The Ron Hayes. Wonderful, wonderful man. So you got to actually be wing commander and train some of these guys that became future admirals and leaders in the Navy. That's amazing. Well, I wouldn't, wouldn't put it quite that way. We served together, and I hope that uh, I had something worth rubbing off. There, there's an admiral, Denny Wisely, who was a... Um, Ardvar and, uh, and we're, we're great friends. Yes. Oh, he did everything. Commanding officer of the Kitty Hawk. Yeah. What a guy. We get together almost every year at Tailhook. Danny still alive? Yes, indeed. Over to Phoenix area. And, and he so also has, he has a whole or a ranch in uh, Wyoming or Colorado, mm-hmm. something like that. And he was a blue angel too. Oh, he's everything. <laughs> How do you know all this? I'm a student of history, Royce. Yeah, I have been just... I have been a student of aviation history ever since I was a kid. Well, and you're you're showing it to <laughs> well, to good avail. Well, it, it does me well environments like this. Denny wisely uh, shot down a MIG, and, and I think a, he even another commanded. airplane too. Yeah, and another airplane too, like a I, I think it was a propeller driven airplane. A- so. Yeah, an AN something, right? AN2 Colt. An AN2 Colt. That's it. And he was a Blue Angel, and I think he commanded the Blue Angels, too. An incredible, incredible career. I I wouldn't doubt it. So you worked around a lot of really famous people. Yeah, in several services. I can only imagine what it must be like. Like Omar Bradley. (laughs) <laughs> like Omar Bradley and Eisenhower. When were you working for with Bradley and Eisenhower? Well, following Soviet encounter, uh, Eisenhower had just been elected to president, and he said that if elected, he would go personally to Korea and and take a look at matters. So it was planned, and this event happened, and he said, "I want to meet that guy." <laughs> so he did. So what was that conversation like? How long did it last? What did you guys talk about with President Eisenhower? Well, I first brought in to meet Mark Clark, Omar Bradley, and Chairman the Joint, or where he was, and uh, Admiral was going to be the next chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh-huh. and uh, Sec Defense, and all that. And while we were waiting for, we called him Mr. President, mm-hmm. and when he came in the room, one of the four stars at Ridgeway, or we had a bunch, said, gentlemen, uh, the president, and we all came smack to, and he said, at ease, boys, at ease. So he was brought over to meet me, and uh, which was, I guess, part of the reason, I, the reason I was there is part of the reason that uh, we've been. He took me by the elbow and led me over to a big overstaffed leather chair, uh, pretty much close to Omar Bradley, and uh, sat me down and actually pushed me into the chair, <laughs> sat on the arm of it, put his arm around me, and uh, said, uh, now, before we get down to business, we ought to have a drink, don't you think? I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, we have uh, bourbon and scotch, water and soda. What do you have? I said, a bourbon and water, please. He said, we have awfully good scotch. <laughs> I said, well, sir, I'd prefer bourbon and water. Young man, we've got great scotch. <laughs> I'd prefer bourbon and water. Lieutenant, we've got the world's greatest scotch. And the all these four stars that suffer going wild over this dumb kid. And I said, Mr. President, I drink bourbon and water. And he said, oh, John, that's his son, the bartender. Oh, John, give him the bourbon and water. <laughs> <laughs> and all these four stars are all like going, ah! Yeah. I was doing so much for you. Lieutenant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need to learn a few things. 
Royce, think about those men and what they did during the Second World War. Eisenhower, Bradley, Mark Clark, all of them were just incredible commanders. Yeah, uh, uh, Jocko Clark, who uh, escorted me uh, to the event, was the more or less junior officer there of, of the flags. Yeah. <clears throat> and he was, he was the commander of the Naval Forces uh, Task Force 77. He's the one that set it up so that the encounter happened. Mm -hmm. That was his choice of events that we were unable to do proper service to the enemy's warehousing and manufacturing yeah. right up on the Yellow River. So he had us uh, form up with three carriers, and about 20 or so escort ships and go up there and do a job on them. I'm assuming this this happened after you'd shot down the MiGs. All of those people in the room probably knew your experience, didn't they? I have no idea. We didn't discuss it. They do, I'm sure, and I think they knew that I was sworn to not talk about it, and they didn't tempt me. <laughs> didn't tempt you. That's funny. <laughs> so how long were you in the room with them? What happened after that? Did they did they just talk to you for a few minutes and then escort you out, or did, did you get to stay in the room and listen to their conversation? No, the conversation was pretty much between the president and me. And uh, that probably lasted another half hour or something like that. And then they were going to dinner and all of them had their aides there. And I was invited into a wonderful meal with the aides of all these important people. And then when that was over, Admiral Clark came and got me because uh, anyway, he wanted to see me personally. So I was taken to his uh, private uh, suite mm -hmm. and uh, chatted with him. And the same kind of discussion, I imagine, with the president? With Pretty the, much. Uh, I think he wanted to know basically our operation, uh, probably how well we were trained, how uh, well was the Navy doing its job and how proud how proud was I of being a part of it and uh, why he shouldn't be proud of running the show. Did he ever ask you about things that you thought needed to change to make uh, the carrier battle groups more effective or do more effective operations in the war? I don't think so. Maybe with Edward Jocko Clark, mm -hmm. because we spent time flying from Pusan to uh, Seoul. Yeah. In a 747, so we uh, sat by each other and chatted. That would have been an amazing meeting to be around at that time period, mm -hmm. Royce. Mm -hmm. Amazing meeting. Yeah. Uh, I think you mentioned that you spent some time in Washington, D.C. also. Uh, my mind just went blank about what you did well, in Washington, D.C. Not, not in regard to this matter. No, yeah. but I was... Later in your career. My first... But my first assignment in Washington was head of promotion plans for the Bureau of Naval Personnel. My next assignment there was uh, OPPO 5A uh, Executive Assistant Senior Aide to DC and all for Air, Admiral uh, Conway. And I was there oh, less than a year when uh, Sybil Stockdale, wife of Admiral Stockdale, well, he was commander at that time, and he was the senior prisoner of war. Yes. And there's a whole lot to be said about that, that I got involved in because she was meeting, as she sometimes did, with the Secretary of the Navy, Chief of Naval Operations, Chief of Naval Personnel, Chief of Navy Air. And at lunch, she casually mentioned, if you don't take some Navy aviation captain who has been there and put his career on the line for these guys right now, you're not trying hard enough. Well, when uh, Chief of Naval Air, my boss, came by, my desk was right outside of his office, patted me on the back, says, I'm going to miss you, Royce. <laughs> the next day, I was they say I was head of prison war matters for the Navy. They had to start it from scratch and run it. And it was an amazing assignment. Oh, I can only imagine. John McCain, Admiral Stockdale, all these naval aviators. You know what, Royce? I got to meet some of these people at the 25th Vietnam POW reunion in Texas at Ross Burroughs Ranch. Oh, yeah, I, I met him at the commission of the USS 
Stockdale uh, here on the West Coast. Had a very pleasant uh, luncheon mm-hmm. afterwards. At one time, he was thinking about recruiting me to go to Iran when they had the F-14s. Uh, it never happened, but uh, we talked about it. He was recruiting you to go to Iran and be like a uh, point of contact with their F-14 yeah, squadrons? Yeah. Oh, yeah. my gosh. That would, have been a, that would have been an, an incredible opportunity. Well, some of my friends did. Did go and do that. Did they? Do you know T.R. Schwartz? I've heard that name. Yeah, I've known him since the, back in the 80s when I was uh, assistant air ops on the Independence. I was plank owner on the Independence Station in uh, Brooklyn when it was being built. And then I was sent to Rhode Island in charge of the 3,000 uh, sailors that were getting specialty training up there. Yeah, so from that, uh, then, then we got the ship commissioned and uh, the air wing with TR on it uh, was the assigned uh, air wing. You know, I got to know him then, but I I know him very well since that time. Yeah, he's got an amazing story too. Oh so. man, yeah, he's uh, he's ejected the timer more, and uh, <laughs> you know his yeah. main thing was he shot down a Mig with an A4 firing an air to ground missile. That's why I heard the name. Of he course. shot it down with a Zuni rocket. Yeah, that's right. The only person to ever shoot down a Mig with an unguided rocket. Do you happen to know Vic Viscara? No, but I've heard of him, and I've heard of his son too. And so, yeah, he's well, he's the movie on. maker. Yeah, he's the he's done incredible yeah. work on those movies too. His name is Mark. We really call him Viz. Yeah, uh, Vic was flying a one hundred and five on uh, Route Pack One, and something happened. He was not shot down. Something went bad, and he punched out. Got rescued by a Navy helo and taken out to, I think, a destroyer. And so he spent a few days on the Navy ship. And I tell you, that's, he loves it. He loved it. <laughs> well, see, Royce, that's the crazy thing. My wife will tell anybody, Mark will do anything to get on board a, sh- a Navy ship at sea. He should have been in the Navy instead of the Air Force. He'd rather be on a ship than in a tank. <laughs> there you go. From wiser sources. <laughs> I did it because I had to learn how our customers did business behind my tanker. And I sure. learned so much by going out and being with the air wings. And I created, as I mentioned, the Navy portion of our KC-135 weapons school syllabus because I was the only one that had been on an aircraft carrier. And of course, going up to Fallon, I found out that you guys had a secret manual, you know, that is the Naval Strike and Air Warfare Manual. And we taught out of that. But I did the Air Force didn't even know that publication existed until I went up there and started hunting around. And Top Gun was actually the validator for that section. We actually gave that portion of the syllabus to them and had them validate it to make sure we were teaching the right things. Well, guess what? What? When I was at uh, Nellis, Bruce Blasey wrote No Guts, No Glory, which was the booklet, pamphlet, manual for air-to-air fighting. And Royce Williams wrote the air-to-ground section for the Air Force. Really? Yeah. You wrote the air-to-ground section. Now, see, that's something that I have never heard. A Navy guy wrote the air-to-ground portion of our weapons school's early syllabus. That's great. Mm -hmm. But you know what? You know, that's, that's good because you have to fight jointly. And we haven't been real good at that until after 9-11, I would say, because all of the services, you know, like the root pack system, remember, root pack 6A, 6B, the Navy had one portion of root pack 6, the Air Mm -hmm. Force had one portion of it, when all of us should have been fighting up there together and going up Mm -hmm. there and blowing things up. That's hindsight. Well, where we really were sticklers on that was SAC. I was in the meeting on the USS Independence with CNO, probably Chief of Staff Air Force, and backup admirals and generals, where we were discussing this because the uh, SAC decided that Navy wasn't necessary at all. We could, they could handle the whole mission. 
So we, we had our discussion. <laughs> Things turned out as they turned out. But it was indeed a heavy session. And I happened to be sitting on the edge of it. <laughs> so anyway. strate- Strategic Air Command came over there and said, we'll take care of all this? Oh, indeed. They were pressuring. We don't need extra service. Think of all the extra money doled out for lack of, well, heck yes, just fighting one another. You're wasting money. Yeah, and look how in linebacker, yeah. the Christmas bombing campaign of 72, the B-52s were actually being protected by the A-7s and the A-6s as they yeah, were going. You know, right. you know where the uh, B-52s came from? Uh, that island in the Pacific that the Brits own. Oh, uh, Diego Garcia. Yeah. Uh, I think I already told you that, but I'm the guy that accepted their offer from the Brits for uh, use by the U.S. forces. No, you didn't tell me that story. Tell that story. Well, that, that's the story. <laughs> that's all there is to it. I, I was flown out there and I had a little discussion with people, looked over the, uh, the grounds and all and decided... Whatever we needed, the RCBs could really fix it, and uh, it would be very suitable. Royce, I have flown out of Diego Garcia in a tanker. Yeah, well, I, I flew out of it in a, a Grumman uh, something or other, twin-engine, six-place passengers, something like that. Just yeah, being out, flown of the cod, with, out of the car. Yeah, yeah. yeah my, uh, my admiral owned that airplane when I was chief of staff come for Westpac. Those were some incredible missions. I I stopped there on the way up to Saudi Arabia for Desert Shield and then Mm -hmm. actually operated out of there uh, refueling B-52s that were going into Afghanistan. And Royce, I have never seen that many bombs on a trailer in my life. (laughs) Well, I tell you, it's heavy duty. It was a great place to operate out of. You did good because uh, that's a wonderful place to to operate out of and and in the middle of the, <laughs> the Indian Ocean, but well, boy, there's some long. Likewise, missions. likewise, Guam in uh, Vietnam. My gosh, when they would come on in and uh, knock everything down for two miles at a stretch, they everybody took cover. Oh, I know. They would drop a hundred and five five hundred pound bombs out of the big yeah. belly B-52s. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That no. amazing? Yeah, they just uh, plowed a new path to yeah. hell or something like yeah. that. Well, you've been around some amazing people, right? <laughs> in your 97 years. Indeed. Yeah, indeed. This F-86 uh, schooner here has got some good coffee that Tammy made. <laughs> <laughs> she is a whiz, I tell you. You ought to know her. Wow. Well, if I ever get down to Escondido and San Diego area, I will come by. You know that. Yeah. It'd be fun to come by and just sit down and talk. Well, sir, we have been talking for another hour and a half. You and I have interviewed for three hours now. Thank you. Thank you once again, Royce, for sharing these incredible stories with my Lessons from the Cockpit audience. I can't thank you enough for being here with us. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it. People like Royce Williams are a national treasure. And after what he went through, he deserves the Medal of Honor. But having a hard time pushing that through, they don't have anybody to sponsor it, either in the House or in the Senate. And that's what it takes. But to all my listeners out there, now you understand why I love what I do. Because I get to share these stories and lessons learned with all of you. And these are just phenomenal stories and phenomenal people that have gone through these extraordinary and extreme military, commercial, and even general aviation flying operations. Please share this episode and previous episodes of the Lessons from the Cockpit show with your friends and family and loved ones. You can find them on my website, markhasera.com, under the podcast pull down box and please all of you go to wallpilot.com because that's where our show is completely supported from 
four foot, six foot, eight foot vinyl prints of airplanes you can peel off and stick to the walls of your home, office, or hangar. We have 123 ready to print that you can pick from right now, but we also do custom aviation art. A little more expensive, a little more involved. We do a lot of research on these, but folks, you can even read the stenciling on the airplanes and the missiles and Everyone that sees these things just absolutely loves them because they're an incredible conversation piece. Your airplane on your wall that you get to talk to people about. Next week on the Lessons from the Cockpit show, we're going to talk to a Command Chief Master Sergeant who started out in the medical area but became the Command Chief Master Sergeant for numerous flying bases to include one in Iraq and my favorite, Fairchild. So that's what we're going to do next week on the Lessons from the Cockpit Show. Please share these episodes with family and friends, and we will talk to you once again next week on the Lessons from the Cockpit Show.